Chicago. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome everyone this morning. Thank you for joining us um, and especially welcoming Annalisa Samara this morning, who's going to be speaking about specifically um, NSF SBIR submissions. Um, so we'll get started in just a minute. I do want to um, especially recognize the Illinois FAST Center from the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, as well as our friends at um, uh, Fulton Labs um, uh, Innovations and also um, World Business Chicago, who has helped to promote this event. Both groups have helped to promote this event and have been making sure that we get a great number of attendants. And as we all know, the bottom line is to try to get more SBIR money into the state of Illinois. So that's what we're here to learn about today. And please do continue to attend these events that the FAST Center puts on. An excellent point that Annalisa made last week in her introduction was that as a young entrepreneur um, applying for SBIRs for the first time, it took her, you know, an, attending seminars like this, a number of um, go arounds before she was ready to make the submission. So it's not something that you can necessarily just learn one time. Um, please do continue to attend these um, seminars. So with that, I will turn it over to Annalisa. I think that many of you are familiar with her um, already. She is a pillar of entrepreneurship um, and startups in health tech, specifically in the Chicago area. She is a UIC grad and we're very fortunate to have her in our entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Illinois. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Cynthia. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a pleasure, um, you know, meeting all of you. And thank you so much for carving out your mid-morning hour um, uh, with me to, um, you know, learn a little bit, discuss a little bit uh, about a topic that is uh, really near and dear to my heart, and that's um, SBIR grants. In particular, National Science Foundation or NSF grants, and even deeper than that, budgeting, preparing a budget for that grant, and on the other end of the spectrum, uh, time and effort, effort reporting. So we're kind of taking this like bookended approach, pre-award in uh, just kind of diving into the budgets, uh, and then kind of post-award in uh, you know a, a doing appropriate uh, time and effort reporting by way of timesheets. Um, so, you know, I think we have a, a growing group here, um, still cozy, so if you do have questions, please uh, drop them in the chat, um, and, and Cynthia will uh, interrupt me at the appropriate time um, to um, ask, uh, ask the question. So I'm going to share my screen, and let's get to it. So um, I'm Annalisa Samara, again, <laughs> and in terms of my background, I've, I've been working with um, the early stage startups here, primarily in Chicago and on all over Illinois, actually, for close to two decades, wearing many hats, venture capital, tech transfer, um, you know, and being in a number of startups um, at the VC, at the uh, uh, VP level, rather. And currently, I'm the CEO of a company called Reos, which is a spin out out of Northwestern University, and we have a platform wearable sensor that can detect flow beneath the surface of the skin. Um, in addition to my uh, role at Reyes, um, I'm very connected in the entrepreneurial community, especially um, with respect to uh, non-dilutive funding, uh, SBIRs and STTRs uh, specifically. And I love doing talks like this because um, the community has been so good to, to me, my company, and um, you know, I just also know how important it is to get funding in, um, especially non-dilutive funding, um, to you know, uh, not only run your research, but to keep the lights on. So that's just a little bit about my background in terms of grant successes. Um, I've helped a number of companies um, you know, over uh, you know, such a long period of time, since 2008, get all sorts of grants, NIH, DOD, NSF, which is the star of the show today. And uh, through these experiences, I've learned that non dilutive funding can be a company's best friend. So uh, the agenda, um, here's just kind of a list of things I'm gonna go through today. I'm gonna do just a really brief overview on NSF SBARs as a refresher. And to those who were able to join last time, this will be kind of a mini introduction uh, to NSF and at the SBIR program. Then I'll dive into uh, budgets, 
uh, provide some of my own preparation tips for budgets and kind of common uh, pitfalls. And then we'll transition to time and effort reporting, which are essentially timesheets, and then uh, you know more Q&A. But again, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please uh, do drop them in the chat. All right, so let's go. So, um, you know, as far as the SBR program, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, SBR stands for Small Business Innovation Research, STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer. Um, and really these programs are for for-profit, uh, you know, small businesses to develop uh, innovative and unproven technologies. And really the, 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 um, the program goals are to support small businesses to really um, you know, further that R&D so that it can potentially uh, attract private sector dollars and essentially it's to commercialize uh, technology so that it can, um, you know, benefit uh, the American public. So these are the agencies that participate in this, uh, you know, program, this non-dilutive program. And for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, what non-dilutive means, I'm going to keep dropping, you know, that, that word in. So, you know, with typical investing where you get money from like an angel investor or VC, you give up some equity in exchange for cash. So that's dilutive funding. You're essentially diluting down uh, your ownership as opposed to non-dilutive where you get, um, you know, cash from, um, you know, a groups like, uh, you know, these federal agencies listed here um, as a, you know, cash grant, not a loan, and it's not in exchange, um, you know, for any equity. Um, so these are the agencies that participate in the program. We're going to dive, uh, you know, uh, we're going to focus rather on the National Science Foundation. So the National Science Foundation, they fund, uh, you know, close to 400 uh, companies a year through the SBR program. They have a nice $200 million budget. And they really like to commercialize, you know, high risk uh, technologies so that they can, again, you know, benefit uh, the American public. They like to fund novel, disruptive, um, you know, technologies, uh, products, and they include services too. I don't want that to uh, be overlooked. So for those of you who have a service-based business, they absolutely fund that. Again, this is not a loan. Um, and, and really, um, you know, it's the, they fund kind of, you know, the commercialization of the, you know, the, you know, the R&D. What they don't fund is basic research. So typically things in the lab um, and they don't fund, um, you know, incremental improvements to existing technologies. And then finally, they do not um, fund, you know, business development, market research efforts, that sort of thing. That's something that you should do, you know, using um, other sources of funding that uh, the company may have access to. Here's a technology topic areas. Oh, is there a question, Cynthia? Oh, no. Okay. So here's the um, technology. No, just topic. Laura. Oh, okay. No, I was saying there, there was one um, about whether the budget needs to be in the body of the proposal. Oh, great question. Great question. So um, for, you know, the NSF, so uh, the budget is, you know, within the proposal, but it has its own section. So your project description, which is essentially the meat and potatoes of the application is 15 pages. The budget does not go in there. Uh, the budget um, has its own section uh, within fast lane, and there's a number of fields that you need to populate, um, you know, uh, based on the different uh cost categories, direct cost, indirect cost, um, and fee. And I'll get into that. So, so yes and no. So yes, it is included in the proposal, but not in the project description. It has its own, um, you know, uh, section within the entire grant. Great. So um, these are the technology topic areas, uh, you know, within the NSF uh, SBIR program, pretty broad. Um, and one thing, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned last time, if it doesn't seem like your technology kind of fits like a glove into any one of these topics, there's the other topics area, and you can reach out to the program director who manages uh, that portfolio to see if, you know, there could be an opportunity for SBIR funding for your, uh, for your research project. So in terms of the amounts, um, what's great about the NSF, the, the budgets actually have been going up. Um, you know, when I, when I think when I first started, it was like $150,000 uh, or so, but you know, it, it's gone up, it went up last year. Uh, phase one is that feasibility project um, and that lasts anywhere between six to 12 months. There is a hard cap of $275,000. There's some other agencies that can go over this amount. Um, there's even institutes within agencies like the NIH that can go over, um, you know, kind of the, you know, the general budget amount, but the NSF is pretty strict. You know, this is uh, the budget cap for phase one at 275, for phase two, it's a million dollars. Um, 
And then phase 2B, um, that's an extension of your phase 2, you know, extended R&D uh, effort. And, uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, two to one, uh, you know, matching uh, element in that. So if you raise, uh, you know, a million dollars in uh, dilutive investment, uh, then they can fund uh, up to $500,000. Um, I will say, you know, for these, for these budgets, um, they can be reduced um, due to things like improper budgeting, uh, not being detailed in the um, in your line items. Um, so I will say at the phase two level, um, you know, after you get the phase one and you submit your phase two grant, um, they really look deeply um, at your budget and they go line by line, even item by item um, in your materials. And I'll get to that in a second. So they're looking for specific support, especially if it, you know, seems like a, you know, a line item is particularly expensive. So for instance, um, you know, if you have a, a line item that's over $5,000, they, they want to make sure that, you know, that you have, um, you know, backup for that, that you have, um, you know, the support, you know, by way of a quote um, to support that dollar amount. So that's something that you'll be working with, um, you know, your program uh, director on. And then post award, um, you know, I think it's just another important point. Um, you know, it's really important to after you get the grant, and if you get the grant, congratulations, that's awesome. But there's a lot of work, not only you know conducting the research itself, but you know keeping a really um, strong eye on your spend and making sure that you are adhering to the budgeted amounts that you proposed. Um, that you agreed upon, uh, you know, with the NSF. So it's really important to monitor your costs. Um, there is, you know, a chance that, you know, money can be pulled back away from you from improper spending. I've seen that happen to, to one company, but typically, you know, if the NSF, um, you know, sees like, a, you know, has like a, if they see like an item that could be, you know, red flag, they'll, they'll, you know, message you about that sort of thing. But, <clears throat> you know, uh, what's great about, um, you know, the NSF just kind of, you know, throughout, um, you know, the post award period, as you, um, you know, kind of draw down funds from the NSF, you have to, um, you know, include the your amount spent per budget category, and I'll get into those categories in a second, and you, that'll help you uh, make sure that you track your funds appropriately. All right. Any questions on that? I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. Okay. So. Um, there's an actual, you know, online form to fill out the budgets. I'm not going to walk through the entire uh, budget with you. This is, you know, there's a, the NSF does a really good job. They have screenshots that, you know, tell you kind of like the different, um, you know, categories of costs and, you know, how to fill it in. I'll do that at a high level, but more importantly, I wanted to provide you tips as you go through that because things might not be clear as you fill out that budget. So, when you go into um, Fastlane, so this is, you know, you know, the interface that you use to prepare your proposal. So some of you have seen this already. If you are currently preparing for the, the June deadline um, or have seen this from, a, you know, prior submission, but this is what it looks like. Um, you know, to submit, uh, or this is what the interface looks like to, you know, submit your application. There are different sections that you need to fill in when you hit the go button, then it'll take you to another screen. Like for instance, the budget takes you to, you know, the budget. And then this is actually a screen after that where you go into the different, um, you know, categories. So um, you'll have a chance to, you know, edit um, the forms uh, before you actually hit the submit button. So, you know, don't freak out if you, you know, start entering some things and need to make some changes changes, um, you, you'll have a couple of, you know, opportunities um, to, uh, you know, uh, you know, submit, uh, do kind of like a final submission of the application. So as you go through the budget electronically, you're going to be see, you're going to be shown a series of screens that look like this, that, um, that go into the different cost categories. So um, you'll see, you know, several of these that go from um, A through, I think, K. So it looks like this when you're done. So this is like the before screen and this is the after screen. So this is a screenshot of uh, a budget uh, from one of my grants, uh, you know, that I got awarded. So this is what kind of like the final output looks like after um, you enter all of the fields, um, you know, here. 
So this is just kind of a snapshot. Um, so I wanted to go through, um, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, major cost categories. Um, so when you when you put together this budget, so think of it in like three major budget uh, buckets. So first, there's the direct costs. So that's items A through G um, shown here, and then the indirect costs, which is you know line uh, actually it's line I. I said H here. That's actually I, and then the fee. Um, and you know the fee is you know not a direct or indirect cost. It's actually um, you know for uh, you know for NSF it is a uh, percentage of the, you know the total total uh, salary and wages. So for the direct costs, you know think of things that are directly related to the project. So your employee time, travel to a collaborator site, uh, equipment, materials, that sort of thing that are directly related to the R&D project. If you have materials that are um, that you get you, that you purchase for the company that are not directly related to this particular research project, um, you know, don't put that, you know, in that budget, don't put that in the direct, direct cost category, do not put that in indirect cost. Um, I will show you when we get to the, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, timesheets where indirect, indirect R&D, um, you know, effort should go, but that's, uh, you know, uh, in, in a few slides. So just know that for your direct costs, um, you know, this needs to be detailed um, in a budget justification page. So each, each thing that you um, request funding for. So for instance, for your senior personnel, let's say you have your PI and two senior engineers, you need to, in the budget justification page, which is a separate document that is kind of tied to that main budget um, that, I that I showed you in the previous screen, you have to detail, you have to you know, describe um, what, uh, you know, you know, how those funds are being used. And I'll show you budget justification page in just a second. So the other cost category is the indirect costs. So these are costs that are not directly related to R&D. So, but things that are used for the project like um, rent. So if you are renting lab space for the research project, that is an indirect cost. You know, the CEO salary, this one gets kind of tricky. So sometimes, and you know, like it, like in my case, um, you know, the CEO can be the PI of the project. You know, that's that's fine, but you're gonna have to um, you know, uh, be really clear on, on how you kind of divvy up that time, and that'll be in you know the timesheets, and then also in um in your budgets too. So you can have, um, if, you, if your CEO is a PI, um, make sure that it's clear that you have, you know, detailed, you know, how much, you know, time they'll be spending on the project. And then the time she's, you'll um, be clear on, you know, how much time, you know, that individual is spending, um, you know, on other related, on other activity, not directly related to the project. So the, the budget, um, for the budget justification page for indirect costs that, um, does not need to be broken down line by line, um, like what you have to do in the direct costs. And I'll show you budget justification page in a second. And then finally, the other major category is the fee. So you can request up to 7% of the, you know, of the you know, total uh, direct and indirect costs for phase one, um, and up to 10% in phase two. And I've, I know a number of companies that forget that when they transition to phase two, it's still in their mind because they also apply for NIH grants or other grants that um, you know allow you to include a fee, and they forget that they can actually you know ask for a higher amount. So don't forget if you get to the phase level that you can ask for ten percent. So this is you know this you know this money is essentially for you know uh, you know other costs um, for things that are spent in the U.S. that don't fall in the you know direct or indirect budget. So maybe I'll pause right there. I don't know if there's any yeah. questions. Okay. Annalisa, we did have a question and that is that um, it's been rumored that the NSF, if they really like your proposal, like, like the technology, um, they will work with you to help you fix your budget. Is that is that true in practice or is that just wishful thinking? Um, it is true to the extent that, um, 
if you're so reviewers, um, you know, they spend uh, almost all their time reviewing the research proposed, the project description, abstract, that sort of thing. You know, it's not our job to, you know, look at the budgets. They may, you know, look at it quickly. But if your grant is favorably reviewed by the panel, um, then your program director will, you know, send you a note with any questions he or she may have that the panel has. And then the program director at that time will ask you, uh, like, like 99% of the time will ask you to review the budget and make adjustments there. So if the, pro, if the um, you know, uh, uh, the program director says, you know, you know, you did this calculation wrong, or you can't ask for this, uh, this line item in, you know, the budget, you can adjust it. So um, I will say if you, you know, submit your budget at the time, you know, if you submit your budget and, you know, don't be, you know, super nervous because you'll have the opportunity to work with your program director to make the changes that will make all of the costs that you propose allowable for the project. So hopefully that answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, another one that has just popped up and that is, uh, and I think we talked about, yeah, this in the last session. So in the last session, you mentioned one of the requirements as the PI um, being more than 50% employed. Is that, is that something that should be reflected here in the budget slash timesheets? Yeah, yeah. So um, the NSF um, SBA program is very particular about, um, you know, where the PI is employed, whether you're doing, um, you know, SBIR or STTR. Um, so that PI needs to be primarily employed at the company at the time of the award in both of those programs. STTR included, unlike some other agencies like, like the NIH. Um, and, you know, that, that effort, um, you know, uh, of the PI especially um, is, uh, you know, is looked at um, right before, for during award consideration. Um, it is not, it's likely that the program director will want to see evidence um, by way of payroll records. So, um, you know, if if you know the PI, you know, is is uh, primarily employed by the company, then it's easy to pull up those payroll records if you use you know electronic, um, you know, payroll software. Um, I've seen some instances where um, you know the PI was going to be primarily um, you know uh, um, employed at the company at the time of the award. So the evidence you need to provide to support that statement is an offer letter. Um, so that will probably be signed by the board or a member of the board. So hopefully that answered that question. Yes, I think so. Thanks so much. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Um, I'm gonna, uh, you know, keep going um, because mm -hmm. I just want to be, you know, mindful of time, and I'm gonna save some, you know, some time, um, you know, at the end for, for more questions because um, there, I think uh, some of your questions might be answered in, um, you know, some of the slides here. So in terms of the budget justification page, so do you remember how I was telling you that for each of, you know, these, um, you know, for uh, the direct cost category, you have to provide detail in something called the budget justification page. This is what it looks like. So this is a sample that's provided by the National Science Foundation. You can find it on their website. So, you know, you have to, you know, um, organize it by the letters that uh, correspond to, you know, the, the budget categories. So your senior personnel, you know, all the way down to other direct costs. So this is, you know, the, the detail at the minimum, and I say at the minimum, that they're looking for. Um, I like to take it a step further. I'm going to show it to you on the, you know, uh, on the following screen. This is more just, you know, of a tip, especially in the senior personnel section. I mean, this is fine. This is acceptable. But when I put together applications, I think it's important that um, you stand out um, and because, you know, this is a highly competitive uh uh, you know, uh, grants, right? So, you know, a lot of small businesses want this grant. So you want to give reviewers no reason to say no. And one of those ways is through the budget justification page. And the way that I like to do it, here's my example from one of my funded uh, grants here. So this is the sample that the NSF provides. It's just a sentence for senior personnel. I like to be a little bit you know, extra, I guess, in terms of this, I think, you know, you will provide your bio sketch, that'll be uploaded. Don't assume that the reviewer will remember everything that they read. Sometimes 
actually not sometimes, oftentimes, I put important things that I want the reviewers to walk away with kind of sprinkled throughout the application. And one of those areas is the budget justification page. I want the reviewer to know that my senior personnel are really senior and they're the right team to execute this project. So here's an example. So I'm the PI of this particular grant and I put here, you know, um, I, I kind of talk about my experience because one of the major things that the reviewers look for is that you have evidence of leadership and that because they want to have confidence that you can not only successfully lead the project, but that you can execute it and that you can complete it. That's what they want to know. And for them to have that confidence, you got to, you got to bring out the good stuff. You got to say, well, I did, you know, you know th this is what, you know, the PI did and do that for other members and see your senior personnel, because you want the reviewers to kind of like, after they, you know, read this page to say like, wow, this team is really good. So that's why I should include that. Um, also include the amount requested for that particular individual always include the specific role that this individual would be playing, um, you know, in, in the grants, um, you know, that's especially important. And then I have this final point here is, um, so um, this, is a, this is a very important, um, uh, I guess, topic within uh, NSF SBI budget reviews is that they're very specific that you use Department of Labor or DOL, um, uh, you know, uh, codes. Um, you know, that, that match to, you know, particular, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of like job, job titles within the, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, website, and you can find that on, um, you know, the NSF SBIR page, that you have to look up the, you know, individuals kind of, you know, um, you know, I guess like, a, you know, a job uh, title, and then you match it to the geographic area in which you live, and you use that salary rate. That is very important, because if you don't, don't um, the the uh, program directors and especially the auditors at the phase two level they're gonna know they're gonna know so it's it's very you know you have to you know be very clear uh, about that so for instance you know this is the code that matches you know uh, my uh, technical background um, so it you know it's a particular rate but I get paid above that rate so you know, um, you have to state um, in the project, in the budget justification, if you choose to go above that rate, you have to say, uh, you have to state that. Um, um, otherwise, um, you know, the, you know, kind of the, the uh, auditors will call that out. I'm going to pause right there. I know I kind of said it a lot for the budget justification page. I don't know if there's any questions uh, on that in terms of the personnel. Um, not at the moment. No. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have one. I beg your pardon. This is from Andy again. He's wondering um, if you're a founder and an owner, what if you're a founder and an owner and take no salary? Yep. Yep. So I've, I've seen that. Um, so, you know, you can, um, uh, you can, you can put, you have to put the amount of effort that you'll be putting towards the project. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, they'll want to see other folks on the senior personnel take salary. Um, so, you know, I think they respect that, you know, certain, you know, founders, especially if you're, you know, the PI of the grant, um, you know, will essentially you're working uh, for your equity um, and that's fine. Um, but they'll want to see other senior personnel, um, you know, draw salary because one of the big goals of the entire SBR program is, you know, job creation. Um, so it's important that uh, other members um, of the company get paid on the grant. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Annalisa, because I think sometimes we lose track of this. I mean, the SBIR program is a matter of economic development for each mm -hmm. state, and it is about job creation, and it's not just about, you know, innovation for the sake of innovation. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, I think it, it really... Um, uh, it helps um, during the review, especially, and this is just a, a tip, especially at the phase two level, if you show growth between phase one and phase two in terms of job creation, um, that makes reviewers happy because they say, you know, the early, dollar, the early dollars that we put in you in phase one, we did great research and you were able to hire people. Um, and, um, you know, you put that in your phase two application, any hires that you had, or any hires that you plan to bring on if you get the funding. You know, the reviewers love that. You know, job creation is, is very important in this program. 
All right. So I'm gonna keep going here. So um, I'm just gonna go through important budget points about uh, the labor. So direct labor, um, just so we're clear, that's existing employees, not consultants. Do not put consultants in the direct labor, um, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the budget. Some other agencies uh, will allow you to do that, but not the NSF. These are folks um, that are employees of the company. Um, so they can be existing employees, uh, uh, folks that you have um, extended offers to, um, and, you know, uh, recently, I guess, you know, maybe right, right before um, the submission, folks that are to be hired at the time of award, um, you know, that also uh, constitutes direct labor. Again, um, you have to use the Bureau of Labor Statistics salary rates based on geography. And um, again, if that rate is lower than what you actually pay them, you can only build a government for that Bureau of Labor Statistics salary rate. And you have to, through other company funds, pay that delta. That's on you. Direct labor does not consist of consultants. I just said that, but that's just a huge, another, just a huge point uh, to remember. And then um, unpaid uh, founders. So uh, when you actually um, you know, draw down funds, if they're getting zero dollars, that's, um, you know, you wouldn't, obviously, that's just kind of a minor point, you're not drawing down any labor there. So an important uh, budget points for travel, that's also another direct cost. Um, what's great about the NSF is that they want to make sure you're successful from the beginning to the very end. And one of the ways they do that is a phase one grantee workshop. So if you're awarded, they have this workshop for you to, you know, help you, um, you know, uh, kind of just not only successfully execute your project, but also, um, you know, help you in terms of um, uh, conducting customer discovery interviews and prepping for phase two. So they allow for travel, um, $2,000 per person. That's typically the PI and one other other senior, um, you know, uh, member uh, that's on the research project, um, so that's allowable. Um, and then, you know, travel, um, you know, uh, in the budget is really permitted um, for for uh, if it's if it's necessary for the completion of R and D activities. So if you have a collaborator in another part of the state. Um, you know, using, you know, train travel, airfare travel, that's, you know, allowable. Foreign travel is not permitted uh, because it's taxpayer dollars and they want the, the, the dollars to stay in the U.S. So uh, another important budget point I want to talk about is equipment. Um, equipment is not allowed at phase one. Um, you know, that's, you know, an NSF rule. Um, if it's something you absolutely need, maybe that's something that you can talk about with your program director. Um, I, I don't know any companies that have gotten equipment from the NSF. Um, I'm not, you know, I can't say that um, it, it doesn't happen. It may happen, but it's typically unallowed uh, for phase one. It's okay for phase two, though, and equipment has to be specific for the research project. Um, it can't be something that can be, you know, generally used for, you know, other areas of research. And that's why equipment, you know, gets tricky. Um, for me, I usually don't uh, budget for any equipment because especially at the phase two level, you know, the auditors, and, and that's maybe I'm talking about audits uh, kind of loosely, but before you get awarded for phase two, you have to pass an audit and they review your spend from phase one and your proposed spend for phase two uh, from the budget you presented. I don't like to put in equipment because that, um, you know, uh, undergoes a lot of scrutiny. Um, you can if you want to, but be sure that you, um, you know, provide multiple quotes for a particular um, item. That's what some of the auditors like to see. Yeah, moving on here. Oh, my screen is frozen. Oh, wait, hang on one second. Um, okay. Let me. Annalisa, we do have yeah. a question about travel, and that okay. is if the collaborator is within driving distance. Um, can travel expenses cover driving expenses? Yes, yes. Oh, yes. So you have to go to, um, there's a government grant site, government, sorry, government uh, site um, for mileage. Um, and um, I can, uh, you know, send the link out, you know, after this, but um, there's, there's a maximum allowable amount, um, you know, uh, that is reimbursed to you based on mileage from point A to point B. So, 
there's a government rate for that. If you go over that, um, you know, that's, uh, on, um, that's on the company to pay for through other funds. Yep. Okay, and then there's a, uh, are there, was there another question, Cynthia? Um, no. Okay, great, great, great questions here. Um, this is always, you know, I always find this to be a, a weird thing to ask, but there's all, there's this participant support cost. This is typically for, you know, think of, you know, um, you know, uh, kind of human studies, that sort of thing, um, you know, but for phase one, you know, you would leave that blank. Um, you know, the NSF SBI program doesn't typically fund traditional clinical trials. That's more NIH territory, maybe other um, um, other institutes. But you know, they do fund some you know um, very early uh, you know feasibility studies um, in phase two, and that's something that you should talk about with your program director if you uh, want to pursue that route. So, in terms of kind of you know moving uh, along in the budget. Um, as you progress in fast lane, um, you know, after you do, uh, if you get all the way down to other direct costs, there are a number of kind of, you know, line item, you know, cat, just kind of like subcategories within other direct costs, which includes materials and supplies, publications, and, um, you know, other things um, listed here. And um, you would put the total for each of those line items here. But I wanted to kind of go you know, subcategory by subcategory um, as you prepare, um, you know, those line items. So materials, this is a really important point. Um, when you put together your materials budget, just don't put some random amount to, you know, so that you can get to, um, you know, the $275,000 for phase one, for instance, you actually have to itemize each cost item. And it can be painful, especially if you have um, a lot of items, um, you know, for, for your research. Um, I will say for one of my phase twos, I think I had maybe 20 line items. And the auditor at that time, you know, during my phase two review, wanted evidence for each of those costs that I proposed. So I'm not saying that, you know, this will happen to you, but it can happen to you at the phase two level that they'll want to see evidence that, you know, item ABC is, for instance, is $635. So, you know, I think to just save you some, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, a headache during the uh, award consideration period, you know, I would do your homework and pulling up the actual, you know, costs. I know a lot of folks who like to estimate these things. Oh, ABC item is around, I don't know, $635, but save your, you know, self some time by getting the actual costs and then, you know, saving those pages as PDFs, put them in a folder in your computer so that when an auditor or your program director says, hey, show me the evidence for this, you've got it because, um, when you are considered for award, um, you know, you have a certain amount of days to turn information around. So when you submit your grant for the NSF for phase one, it's typically about six months till you get um, the award if you are awarded. But, you know, around like the four month timeline or so, four month mark rather, um, the, uh, if the grant was favorably reviewed, the program director will send you an email saying, you know, asking you some questions. And, you know, some of those questions might be, you know, proof of, of things like this. So materials, make sure you itemize your costs, purchase items only in the U.S. If your item uh, cannot be funded in the U.S., talk to your program director about it. Um, you may or may not be allowed to purchase it with NSF funds. Don't go over $5,000 per item needed because then you'll go into equipment land. Um, just don't, I wouldn't do that. Save yourself the headache. Um, and that's kind of the threshold in which um, typically the NSF um, kind of determines what's material and what's equipment. So um, go for those lower cost items. So the other direct cost categories, consultants, I get a lot of questions about consultants all, all the time, like who are they, what's needed for them, that sort of thing. These are typically individuals who are not employees by the companies. Um, you know, they're kind of like 1099s as opposed to W2s. W2s are employees, that's like, you know, tax document, 1099s are, um, you know, uh, kind of like individual consultants. Um, for submission, they, this individual needs a biosketch too. 
They also need to provide a signed commitment letter that gets uploaded into the supplementary document section. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, one question I get asked, I don't have it here, is, um, you know, you're only allowed a certain number of letters, um, three letters for phase one, I believe. Um, does that consultant letter count towards that three letter maximum? No, it does not. Save that for, you know, you know, other things. So, you know, potential customers, investors, that sort of thing. This letter is a stand, you know, that's, that's on its own. So biosketch, sign letter of a commitment, make sure that your letters um, really specify what the tasks are, how much effort they're um, spending on the project. Um, the NSF, you know, just like salaries, they're very strict on how much consultants can be paid. Uh, they max out at $1,000 a day, which seems like, you know, a pretty, um, you know, modest amount for consultants because consultants are typically expensive. They define a day as eight hours. If you want to pay the consultant, uh, a rate above that, so that's about, I think that's $125 an hour, the company has to cover the delta. That's not on the NSF. So just uh, keep it. Was, was there a question on, on the consultants? There is a question here. Um, so if my project needs to hire um, a CRO for certain experiments, how should I budget for this and what's your recommendation? Yeah, so I would do it under... Uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, this other, other direct cost, other. So um, that's where I would put, um, you know, your CRO, whether, you know, it's a, you know, uh, for an animal study or something else, you know, that's, that's what I would put there. You put that there and you'd have to include um, the, the, um, uh, the quote, um, attach it to your budget justification. Um, and, and then you have to describe the work um, that the organization is doing um, in, in detail there. Yeah, and um, just for the person that asked about driving, I did put a link to the site, oh, the great. Illinois site. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, yes. no problem. So, that, so that's very, very important. Okay, so uh, moving on to you know, other subcategories under other direct cost subcontracts. This is typically any university or research lab partners that you're working with. Uh, a very important note, um, subcontracting organizations have their own budget. So I've seen some mistakes. I'm going to go back a few slides here. Um, when, when I see the grant assembled, if I'm reviewing a grant, and then I see a PI from the university under, under the PI of the company, that's a mistake that, you know, individuals at the university, if it's a subcontractor, they have their own budget. So, you know, um, that's, that would definitely need a revision if you do that. Um, and if you're favorably reviewed um, and are, you know, considered for award. So, um, yep. And they also need a budget justification too. So, um, oh, and then, you know, it's not here. And I know this whole topic is about budgets, but speaking of sub-awardees, and I just don't want this to be, you know, you guys to forget this when you submit it. Um, so sub-awards need their own budget, budget justification, and facilities page. Don't forget that. That's, you know, ultra mega important, especially if you want to convince the reviewers that, you know, you have the right resources, equipment, et cetera, to successfully complete the project. A lot of these universities have that page already. Um, the admins have it ready, especially for the universities that submit a bunch of grants, they'll, they'll have it ready, include that, attach it to the facilities page of the company as one PDF and upload that. Um, the other direct cost category is the other. I know I talked about it briefly, but I just want to mention a few things that you can budget for, um, which are unlike other um, uh, agencies. So, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that the NSF is so supportive through the entire process from the moment, even before you apply by way of i throughout um, the grants by, you know, by way of the boot camp. But then also they allow you to hire a CPA, you know, an accounting group um, for, you know, helping you, you know, uh, prepare financial reports um, to, you know, help you, you know, uh, you know, manage your costs and time and effort for $10,000. That's really nice. Um, and, you know, that's, that's considered an other direct cost. Um, so you don't have to put that in your, in your indirect. So that's, that's really great um, because, you know, the one of the reasons why they do this is because at the phase two level, 
um, again, you are, you have to undergo an audit before you've been awarded and you know your your books have to be clean you gotta have you know your your accounting um you know your your chart of accounts your financial statements you have to look really solid um and i would do that um you know with a a cpa that has sbr experience um and you know i think i i want to bold and underline that i only work with accountants who have direct sbr experience um because you know not every accountant is the same so, you know, if you're interviewing an accountant, make sure that this, you know, the individuals have uh, that experience. Um, other line items that um, you can include in the other direct cost category is the, you know, the boot camp for phase one awardees. Um, there's also technical and business assistance um, that you can, you know, put in there. You have to talk with your program director when you want to spend that money. That's at phase two for fifty thousand dollars, and then other service providers. So, like your CROs, software development firms, other services, you put that in the other cost category. So, um, I want to now switch gears to kind of like you know indirect costs. Um, you know, the safe rate for the NSF is fifty percent. I put forty percent for NIH because I know some of you are looking at NIH too, and um, you know how indirect is calculated for NSF, and this is an important point is that the base is the, um, you know, salaries and wages. So not all direct costs. So, you know, over in NIH land, it's all direct costs, but NSF is just that your, your base is the salary and wages only. And then you take a percentage of that. So 50% of the sum of salary and wages. Um, and then, you know, the, the indirect cost rate does have a cap of 150%. Um, I wouldn't use this unless you have that rate negotiated with a federal agency. If you do not have a federally negotiated rate, go with 50% or lower. Um, that's like no questions asked rate. If you want to go above that, you have to have um, a negotiated indirect cost rate letter. Um, important points for the indirect costs. Um, these are some of the potential items that you can include. I always get asked, is there a list somewhere of all the indirect costs that I can, you know, um, you know, put, um, you know, or, or kind of draw money from? Um, I, you know, I, I see, you know, kind of tidbits here and there on the NSF and NIH website. This is typically something that you would work uh, with your, um, you know, uh, your accountant who's well-versed in SBR accounting. But these are the typical things. So, you know, facilities, so rent for your lab, office space, um, you know, uh, you know uh, insurance, health insurance, uh, you know, that, that type of thing, office supplies, um, you know, fringe is typically an indirect cost rate. So if you put together your budget, um, you'll see a field where you can put in fringe. Um, you know, that is, you know, allowable, um, but, you know, um, you know, typically the reviewers, especially the accounts, especially the, you know, auditors would like to see that included in um, your indirect costs. Uh, so just throw that in there. So um, within the um, kind of the uh, prohibited items, uh, you know, territory have them kind of, you know, listed here. So uh, independent R independent R and D. So that is work that is unrelated to the project. So if you have a platform technology, that's awesome. But you know, you cannot bill for that. That is an indirect cost. So when your accountant, you know, at you know every month is kind of trying to categorize you know, the cost for each, you know, expense, that will be in IR&D, indirect uh, R&D. And here are some other things. And I'm going to kind of zip through. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're coming up close on time, and I also want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, but, um, you know, I think it just some last words on, on budgets, you know, get get an SBR, you know, a well-versed accountant, you know, use uh, accounting software, you know, QuickBooks, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then you have to, when you work with your accountant, um, you know, there, there are things that you have to put together, like your chart of accounts, and it must adhere to certain cost uh, principles. Um, I've said the word audit a number of times because an audit is a really big deal. Um, it can, you know, um, uh, prevent you from, from uh, you know, from getting your phase two awards. Sometimes audits can take two weeks, sometimes it can take a month or a month and a half. It really depends on how many other, um, you know, companies that, that you know, they're, they're auditing, but it's, it can be really intense because they will ask you for things in a short amount of time and expect you to turn that around in that window, or they're just going to move on. 
So here's kind of a laundry list of some of the, you know, NSF budget pitfalls. I kind of went through these, um, you know, throughout the presentation. So if you forget to put letters of, you know, commitment with the rate information, so important, please include the rate for the consultant, um, you know, in your, in your letter. Um, not including um, the right government rate for salary and travel, again, they're very, very strict on that. Um, you know, materials supplies, we talked about that. Um, and then, you know, and then there's math. There's also, you know, uh, I think when you're putting together an application, you're so focused on the R&D and putting, making sure that's solid, you might be calculating things, you know, incorrectly. Um, so just be mindful of that. But again, you'll have the opportunity um, to redo your budget, um, you know, if during a, the award consideration period, because things change. Sometimes, um, you know, employees move companies and you'll, you'll lose a member on the uh, senior personnel side. And, you know, that's your opportunity to adjust the budget. Or if you changed, um, you know, vendors for certain materials, you can, you know, make adjustments at that point. So I want to go really quickly. I'm going to zip through because I want to have, you know, uh, you know, a good amount of time for questions. Time and effort reporting. So this is like, so you prepared your budget, submitted the grant, you got the award. Fantastic. You do your research, but you got to keep timesheets. They're not fun, but they're absolutely required. So this is a sample that the NSF provides. And, you know, basically this is, you know, kind of, you know, paper-based timesheet. There are some organizations that I know that use electronic um, time and effort reporting software, run it by your SBIR, um, you know, accountant to make sure that it's compliant. Um, I'm a little old school when it comes, when it comes to timesheets, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, for me, if, if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. So I like to use the paper-based method. So what the um, auditors like to see is that you um, that you, you track time uh, based on categories. So your project, um, you know, uh, in, in different categories. So this is the sample, um, you know, that the NSF provides. This is the one that I use for my company. So, you know, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, use something similar again, run it by, um, you know, your, your SBR content. So you'll see all these like weird numbers here. These are chart of account numbers based on particular costs categories. This is what the auditor wants to see. So we have, you know, currently two grants going on right now. So it needs to be really clear in your timesheets where the employee is spending the time. So if you have a small team, like many startups do, you work on multiple projects, you know, you need to record that, you know, when, when that, you know, how much time you spend per project. Um, and, you know, how you, if it, you know, it's a full-time employee, you have to get to eight hours in a day. So you have to record, you know, kind of where, where that effort is spent, whether it's, you know, on one SBR, the, SB, the other SBR, if you are, you know, um, if you took some time off, that sort of thing, that, that should be all recorded. The employee, you know, fills this out if you're using the paper-based method, which is what I use because I'm comfortable with that. That needs to be, you know, completed in ink, signed at the bottom, approved by that person's manager. If it's, you know, if there's a, you know, CEO who's the PI, then a board member or the head of finance, uh, you know, run those approvals by your SBR consultant to make sure that, you know, that's allowable, but whoever has signing authority um, as dictated by your accounting procedures for that. So, you know, uh, I went through some of these tips. Um, who fills out timesheets? Every employee in your company. So even your, if you have, um, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, non R and D folks in your company, they have to fill out timesheets too. I know it's painful, but you know they would, uh, you know, they would fall into, you know, their, you know, appropriate, you know, category. Whether it's like GNA, that sort of thing. Talk to your accountant on that. Must be signed. No erasing in the timesheets. You must, you know, like kind of like you know, you know, a good lab notebook, right? You kind of gotta, you know, do the line and you know, initial that sort of thing. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and I want to leave some time uh, for questions. So um, thank you. Yeah. Annalisa, thank you so much. Feel free to submit. Uh, we've got a couple questions to get to, but please do feel free to submit them in the chat. Um, question we have is about a software development firm. Is that considered a subcontractor and therefore impact the 33 and a third subcontracting limit? Yeah. I think, I think the answer is it depends on what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good question. So, you know, I've, I've done, you know, I have a software development firm for my grants. Um, so they would fall in the other, um, 
other other direct cost category. Um, so that does fall into the outsource bucket. So SBRs phase one, um, you know, it's it's typically like a you know two thirds company, one third outsource. So if you're working with a university, if you're working with a software development firm, that is in the outsourced bucket. So do not exceed a third. Um, I have seen some companies get some permission um, from you know the program director um, to exceed that amount because you know that's their research. Um, so that's you know on a case by case basis, but typically um, you know they don't want you to exceed that you know outsourced bucket uh, of a third for SBIR. Okay, thank you. Um, another question on the indirect cost items page: You had marketing as allowed, but sales and marketing expenses are not allowed. Can you clarify the distinction? Oh, so um, okay, marketing and you know sales and market. Let me actually go to the slide, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, sales and marketing. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. Um, well, this is uh, this is under the I put it potentially prohibited items. So I would talk to your SBR accountant on that one because I've had some instances where certain marketing activities um, for you know like let's say like logo development for your product that you're developing is an allowable indirect cost, but for, you know, uh, marketing for like, you know, uh, booth design at a conference was not allowable. That's something that you should really talk to your, um, uh, you know, your SBR accountant about because it can, it, it gets a little fuzzy uh, for marketing um, for indirect costs and what's, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Thank you. Um, and I just personally have seen that examples of that as well, where some things are and some things aren't. So yeah, is. yeah. And that's why you have to work with, um, you know, someone who's well versed in, you know, SBR accounting. So mm -hmm. the way that I, you know, the way that I do it monthly, how I have it set up with my accountant is that they review, um, you know, they, they, they have me or, you know, my finance person categorize all the expenses first mm -hmm. and then they review it and if they have questions then we talk about it so that's why it's important to have work with someone who's well versed in SBR accounting yeah great point um Andy has asked about computer parts um that are made outside of the U.S. for instance yeah. 8k cameras are only made in Germany yeah yeah, I would get permission from your uh, program director. You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, buy it first and kind of, you know, uh, beg for forgiveness later. I just get the okay from the from from the program director, or you could buy it first and just not, you know, charge it towards the grant. Mm -hmm. um, but just get the okay. Um, you know, uh, I, I've seen some instances where some companies, you know, NSF, NIH get that okay, um, but it's it's best to just run it by the program director. Um, on that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank uh, Laura Appenzeller for this question because I was thinking the same thing. And when you said that you use only accountants who have SBIR experience, do you have specific recommendations in Chicago of those accountants? And if so, could you share that information with us? Yeah, you know what? I actually don't know. And I'm being honest, I don't know any Chicago-based SBIR accountants. I think that is a fabulous business opportunity. Uh -huh. So anyone... <laughs> I mean, I, I would I would love it. And it's like, you know, I only like to promote, you know, Illinois stuff and um, you know, the accountants uh, you know, that I work with are in Boston, you know, they're they're fantastic. Um, but that that's a really great business <laughs> opportunity. It really, really is. I get asked all the time and I hate saying there's this firm on the East Coast and there's right. one in Arizona. It's gotta be here. And I wish uh, so maybe you guys, if you have some friends that are, you know, uh, looking for a great business idea, here's one. Yeah, well, the good news is that there are a number in Champaign who oh, great. spend a lot of time working with, with startups specifically, and I think are, you know, um, pretty well versed with SBIR requirements. So not as, not as far as Boston. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And still in the state. Exactly. Um, we have a, a question from Ali, and that is when building a product, um, what kind of research and development work should be in the scope? Are there examples of work items that you have seen that should not be in the scope? Um, so is a usability study of a product funded going to be funded by the NSF? And I, yeah. I think 
anyway, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I think when you put together your R&D plan, think about certain technical milestones that you want to achieve for you to get to the next iteration of, of, of the of the product device, et cetera, what, what you're what you're building. So um, you know, in terms of R&D, these are typically things, well, the things that the reviewers want to see are, are things that um, you would uh, likely do in-house. You know, you may have um, you know, some outsourced partners where you would share some of that work. So the your your um, your research, uh, you know, uh, uh, plan should really um, uh, be divided by objectives and technical things that you want to, you know, want to achieve. Um, some things that are not included, um, that are not uh, typically, um, you know, liked by reviewers in terms of objectives are things like, um, you know, anything that's, you know, marketing and sales related, um, uh, you know, kind of discover usability, discuss that with your program director, because I've seen both ways. I've seen, um, you know, uh, kind of like uh, some of the usability studies fly, and sometimes program directors didn't like that. Um, so they like things that are more in their words or their eyes that are more technical. So if you're developing, let's say, like a user interface, for instance, you know, uh, they would like that. So I would just kind of, you know, discuss that with your, with your program director. Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any additional questions at this point. Uh, Laura Appenzeller has um, listed just a firm off the top of her head that in Champaign that does work with, um, with SBIR grants. So thank you for that, Laura. Yes. But thank you, Annalisa, for another great seminar. Really yes. appreciate it. Lots of really wonderful information. And as Kathy MacArthur, uh, mentioned we are going to be posting this recording to the YouTube channel, to the Fast Center YouTube channel, and everyone who attended today will get a link to that recording. So.